Our next speaker is Yella Hellings from McMaster University, who will be discussing efficient fault tolerant cluster sending, reliable and efficient communication between Byzantine fault tolerant clusters. Uh, Yella, take it away. Well, thanks for the introduction. So I can skip the title page. Uh, so the, our motivation is basically already told by Marco in this uh, keynote talk. And uh, normal blockchains, permission, permission is not really matter, have limited bandwidth. So one way to scale up is to shard these systems and to divide our data into different parts. And then the individual parts can operate on the data independently. Unless, of course, you have more complex stuff. So that's the main motivation of the work I'm going to present. And um, what we realized, if you're going to try to do something like this, of course, operating these individual clusters, we can do that with consensus, proof of work, uh, PBFT, depending on your system. But to interop, to have interoperability between the clusters, you need something more, right? And we decided to look into the communication between these blockchains, between fault tolerant clusters in depth, and then in the permission setting. So how does that and behave in the rest of the blockchain sphere. So if we look at permissionless blockchains, actually, of course, we know them, Bitcoin, Ethereum, all the other ones. Uh, there, one of the earliest interoperability projects was actually the Bitcoin relay, right? Where we were able to translate data from the Bitcoin network to the Ethereum network. Um, lately, there have also been quite a lot of white papers about sharded Ethereum systems like Cosmos and Polkadot uh, proposed some designs for that. And if we go into the research direction of things, there are quite a lot of recent papers on how to do cross, well, cross chain inter transactions uh, via atomic swaps, via atomic commitment, cross chain deals, which all provide some form of communication between blockchains with some kind of guarantees. Um, and this shows that, well, in the last decade, there have quite a bit of different approaches toward interoperability in this permissionless system. So it's a fundamental problem, we think. And we looked at it, well, in the other side of the world, in the permissioned world, um, where, or if we simplify everything a bit, everything is operated by a PBFT-like algorithm. Uh, um, and in the earliest projects where we saw actual interoperability being applied was Stuart and GBFT, which were both geoscale aware systems that divided the blockchain up into smaller pieces that, well, were far apart and then had interoperability between them. Uh, but recently, we've seen quite a lot of sharding projects. So we have uh, a tested hyperledger a few years ago. We have BiShard this year, Chainspace mentioned in the previous talk, uh, Cerberus. They all basically say, well, we have a permission system. We shard it, and we got to make sure that we can do multi-shard transaction processing. And if you look at all these papers, uh, the core there is, of course, your consensus protocol to operate the shards, but also the communication primitive to communicate between shards. And some of the papers address that, others don't. So we decided let's just look at that problem uh, at a core to see whether it's a different problem than consensus. And if so, how does it behave, right? Um, so our first step was to just formalize it as simple as we could. So how do we formalize cluster sending? We have a value V and we have a cluster one and a cluster two. Those are Byzantine fault tolerant, right? They can have faulty replicas in them. And one is sent a value from C2, from C1 to C2 with the three guarantees. The replicas in the cluster C2 will receive that value, at least all the good replicas. Uh, the replicas in the sending cluster will get some confirmation that they know that sending was successful. Otherwise, well, we don't know whether anything happened. And of course, the receiving cluster will only receive a value if that value was actually intended to be sent. So faulty replicas should not be able to forge a message sent to the other cluster and then convince them that that uh, should have happened. And um, we figure that this is basically the most basic requirements you can get for any form of communication if faulty replicas are involved. Um, so we looked at this and uh, we looked at it with a very specific notation um, of a specific angle, namely, we really want to minimize in some of our system the communication between clusters. Uh, because what we found, if you want to have very large scale systems with geo-aware placement of our replicas, then of course within a region, bandwidth and uh, round trip times are not really an issue. 
not even if you use PBFT, but between regions, that's going to be a bottleneck. So we want to minimize that kind of communication. And this already rules out the easiest solution to cluster sending, and that's just to do broadcasting and then do majority voting. Um, so our next question was then, is actually a lower bound on cluster sending. Is there a lower bound on how many messages we need to send between clusters? And we quickly realized that this is the case. So I will not go over all the proof details, but we're gonna sketch it here. So here we have a big cluster with 15 replicas and seven of which are faulty. And we have a small cluster with five replicas, two of which are faulty. And in this case, I can claim that I need at least 40 messages. So whenever I send less than 30 messages between these clusters, cluster sending can fail. And to illustrate why that's the case, we start with five messages because well, the small cluster has five replicas. So if I send five messages, I can make sure that every sender is distinct and every receiver is distinct. So that if any of these are faulty, their impact is minimized, right? But I can't do that for the other, uh, well, seven messages that I have left, uh, eight messages, sorry. Uh, so if I'm gonna send 13 messages or less, some replicas will send either several messages or receive several messages. And in this case, well, there are three replicas that get three messages and two replicas that get two. And we know of all these replicas, two can fail. And in the worst case, of course, those are the ones that get the most messages. So and no matter what I do, I can already lose six messages by just two failures in the receiving cluster. Well, if we do that, we have seven messages left and we have 30 messages in total and we have seven replicas that could be faulty in the sending cluster. So. Uh, no matter how I send my 30 mess, I can always pick my fault replicas in this way to make sure that nothing happens. Um, this is for crash failures. You can also do a similar analysis for Byzantine failures, but you're, you're going to have a factor two somewhere. And then you can also do a similar analysis if you have like crystal sending certificates via threshold signatures, and that reduces to this case again. So well, the idea is all the same. And if we completely formalize it, by the end of the line, the conclusion is going to be, you have two clusters, you're going to send an amount of messages that's linear in the size of the cluster. And the exact details, of course, depends a bit on the ratio between the clusters. You can have some bound of errors and stuff like that. So that's why the exact formulation has these diff and these mod terms. But let's just forget about those. Um, then the next step in our work was, well, we have a lower bound, but that doesn't mean that that's a strict one, right? So we want a nice protocol that actually achieves that lower bound. And the simplest is, of course, if the clusters are the same size, in which case we can just one-on-one -on -one map replicas, uh, send between them, and that will actually work out correctly. And we call that bijective sending. And so we have sketched, well, this is the pseudo code, but we have sketched it working here. Similar size clusters. If we put on all the numbers in the formula of the formalization, we see that we need to send six messages. So I send six messages one on one. And no matter how I pick my uh, well, three fault replicas in the first cluster or my two fault replicas in my second cluster, at least one of these messages will arrive. And then, well, internally, we can redistribute these messages. Um, of course, we can then asks, can we do better? Because a linear amount of messages between clusters, especially if your clusters become bigger, that's still a scalability issue, right? Um, well, the pessimistic person in me would say, no, we can't. Um, we've proven that these algorithms are worst case optimal, but very low guarantees. And of course, in practice, you probably want even more guarantees, so it's gonna be even harder. Um, so whatever we do, we cannot do it better than linear amount of communication in terms of the size of, of the clusters. Um, of course, we can also be a bit more optimistic about things and try things out to see whether we can make an algorithm that behaves good in practice, but in the worst case, devolves in something that's linear, right? And one way to do that is to just roll a dice and use a probabilistic approach. And in that case, we can actually show we can do a whole lot better. So um, protocol in that case is really simple. What you do, you randomly choose uh, replicas to send from and to send to. You do a step that is a sending step. I'll skip over the details, but that sending step should finish in some finite amount of time, of course. 
And if that doesn't happen, then we just retry with other pair of replicas. Now, of course, this basic approach, in the worst case, we're gonna always pick wrong ones. So this is not guaranteed to finish, but it is guaranteed, uh, but it's expected to finish actually in a constant number of rounds. Typically configuration will take four or five rounds at most. Um, if you want stronger guarantees, we can do that. And that case, of course, we're not gonna do just random permutations. We are gonna do some pre-arranging of the options we're gonna take and then we uh, do them in that order. And in that case, you're gonna have the same expected case complexity after you run it to all the mathematics involved, but it's good, it will finish in linear time. It will actually finish uh, in a similar number of communication as the optimal approach. So you can have expected case constant and worst case optimal, that's possible. But of course, because this operates in France, it's gonna have a longer latency than the optimal protocol. Um, so some, just some graphs for performance. Uh, in this graph, we have the two probabilistic approaches. So the green line is the one that terminates always in linear time. And the orange one is the one that might not terminate because it's completely probabilistic. And as you see, they are quite similar. And the best thing is they cap off at around like four to five message rounds, which is completely independent of how big your cluster is. If you have thousand replicas in your clusters, it's still gonna take five messages between these clusters. So that's really good. And if we add the optimal approach, well, the optimal approach, uh, of course, I already mentioned, it's gonna be uh, linear in the size of the cluster. For very small clusters gonna be slightly faster, but for anything that resembles well, what we look at nowadays, like clusters with 10 to 20 replicas already, it's gonna be slower. Um, and then of course, in the literature, like I said, there are already quite a few projects that do some form of interoperability between PBFT style systems. And if we look at those in a bit more detail, then well, GeoBFT uh, designed a quite interesting uh, optimistic approach that tries to do the right thing if your PBFT primers are correct. And if that fails, it has a recovery process that's quite costly. But an optimistic approach is actually faster than our optimal approach because it's really optimized for the, the good case. Um, the chain space mentioned in the previous talk also has an approach. They basically do uh, broadcasting, which uh, if you're going to run that in a single data center, it's going to be super fast uh, because it has just a least amount of recovery or overhead. But of course, if you're gonna have a wide area network then broadcasting is not the way to go, of course, because it's gonna be a quadratic amount of communication. Um, so yeah, there are some alternatives in the literature of what we did. Um, some are faster in some cases, some are faster in other cases. Uh, but what we have at least shown is that there are, there are strict limits and these limits that we've shown and this linear upper bound it's definitely different from what the limits are, the theoretical limits at least on uh, the complexity of consensus of uh, Byzantine broadcasts and stuff like that. So it's uh, it's a different problem and then we can solve it in different ways, some of which have benefits, others which have drawbacks. So we've also already seen some applications of cluster sending and practice. So, like I mentioned, the GeoBFT was a wide scale uh, PBFT deployment that was optimized for a global communication. And that has at its core an intercluster communication protocol to minimize communication between the local clusters. Um, um, well, it's not an approach we uh, described in this work, but it is certainly an interesting approach. Um, in uh, recent sharding protocols that we've been developing, like Bishard, RingBFT, which is the next talk. And Cerberus, we really put cluster sandwich just as a core part together with consensus. And then with these tools, try to design a basically database style uh, sharding. So Bishard shows that you can do two-phase commit and two-phase locking and that kind of system. Cerberus really tried to minimize uh, use of consensus and cluster sending and yeah, cluster sending by abusing an uh, UTXO type uh, data model, which actually allowed us to skip a lot of steps. And WingBFT really looked at the engineering aspect as 
how can we actually implement this and make it super fast with a very clean uh, uh, semantics, with a very clean transaction semantics that makes sense for normal users that do not want to worry about the complexities of multi-shard transaction processing. So um, I would say, uh, look at the next talk, it's very interesting. Um, and uh, other works we've seen around, uh, the, the big ones are tested hyperledger. Um, the test side that it doesn't go into too much detail on how they do communication between shards. So I actually cannot tell how they do it. Uh, chain space actually specifies a really clean protocol. It's the broadcasting, but like I said, the broadcasting does require quite a lot of communication. But it is probably the simplest protocol to prove its correctness. So good choice if you want to know for sure that you're doing the right thing. Well, that's basically all I have to tell for today. If you want to see more information we have, I have the slides of this talk and all other talks related to that on my website. We also have two technical reports on archive. So take a look at those. Um, well, that should be it.